Hello again, Art History 2 students. I hope you're doing fantastically well. Here I am coming from the Vienna Opera House, likely the most beautiful and one of the great places to ever hear and experience classical music. If you ever come to Vienna, where the Vienna Opera House is, it's, it's in this wonderful, wonderful area on this beautiful ring in one of the most beautiful and generally considered the best city in the world to live, or one of the best cities in the world to live. You can go experience people dress up like they would have during Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart's day, actually perform Wolfgang Amadeus's Mozart live in concert. It's a spectacular thing to be able to do. Today we'll be talking about classical music, but also romantic music. So we're moving out of that Baroque music that we talked about. Remember, Baroque music had one affect. It was highly, highly repetitive. And then the third thing is that it was very liturgical. Almost everything is made for the church. This is actually going to slowly change throughout classical music and especially for romantic music that we're going to see later on today. I hope you enjoy our journey. I'm gonna minimize myself right up here. All right. The center of the entire music world is going to be in Vienna during this time period. This is the number one place to live. Mozart is born in Salzburg as we talk about classical music. And so he starts off in the Rococo style, but it really is his music that is going to bring us into the classical music. Remember, remember Rococo is all about fantasy, wit, playfulness. The classical is going to be much more about balance and order. He is actually going to spend most of his life in Salzburg, but also a little bit of time in Vienna. Beethoven is actually going to spend his time and living in Vienna. And so this small country in the middle of um, Europe, Austria, just above Italy, is going to become the center for world music between Beethoven and Mozart. Beethoven is going to start off as a classical music individual as he's in the generation after Mozart. In fact, Beethoven was on his way to become one of Mozart's students when Mozart actually died. He had to find a different director, a different master teacher. Now the features that are going to show up in classical music, I know classical music shares the same dates as neoclassicism and enlightenment. It's going to be on aristocratic social and political norms. So it's gonna be balanced and ordered and calm and smooth transition, very much like the classical world where you have that always calm on the face. And it's gonna be the picturesque. It's going to be beautiful. Romantic music is going to challenge the aristocracy, just like romantic um, art did. The imagination is going to be celebrated. It's going to deal with inspiration from the sublime. The feelings of all mixed with fear or pain invoked these intense emotions. We're going to have strong emotions, love, trepidation, awe, and horror. And romanticism, as you can see, even by the image up here of Beethoven versus the ordered statuesque of Mozart, is going to be on the troubled and tormented hero artist. When you and if you ever get to go to Vienna, it's one of my favorite cities in the world to visit. This is their beautiful cathedral with a very unusual V-shaped crossed tile common called St. Stephen's Dom, or it's dedicated to St. Stephen's. And you can go and you can experience the the music then, and the, if you ever actually have the opportunity of going here, you can experience Gothic um, and Gregorian chants that they sing throughout. So you hear this wonderful richness that shows up within the rock. Classical romantic music centered in Vienna, as I mentioned, and still one of the number one places to live. And they invent one of my favorite desserts on the planet, which is actually invented right here at a store called Demel. And so Demel is right here, right down from St. Stephen's Dom in the main area of the shopping district of Vienna, and they invent what's called a sacher or sacher tort, which is this deep, dark, rich, thick chocolate. That is a very dry cake. It's got just a touch of apricot or raspberry, but mostly an apricot touch, and it's fantastic. So Demel would be my highest rep rep representation. It's where it was invented, and this was a gift and a new dessert for the king, so dedicated specifically Vienna is where the Austrian Habsburg Empire, if you know the Austrian Habsburg from any of your AP world history classes or world history classes, which were fighting constantly for rival of all over Europe with the French kingdom. Marie Antoinette actually comes from the Austrian Habsburg Empire. 
Now, here are the beliefs behind classical music, which of course becomes before romantic music. And again, classical music is 1750 to 1825. They believed, just like in the Enlightenment period, that if they use reason and logic, they could under, undercover universal truths, that there's an underlying order to the universe. And that would be an underlying order to beautiful music as well. There are going to be rules we need to follow within music. And it's really going to be Mozart that established those rules. Beethoven is then going to break those rules and develop this into the Romantic period. It's going to be classical music develop very formal structures like the Enlightenment. It's a quest for reason. Such things like the sonata form, which we see it's really not necessarily created, but popularized and canonized during this time period. Music features in classical music. It's going to be gradual changes of tempo and dynamics and restraint of emotions. So no, you're going to have one, more than one emotion, but it's going to slowly, gradually get there. It's going to start off quiet and sad, and it's slowly going to develop into melancholy a little bit more and the music is going to get a little faster and then eventually we're going to get to happy and grandiose but it may take three or four minutes to make that transition and that change the music is going to serve a highly sophisticated wealthy aristocratic society that is still there and these are going to be the individuals that are the the leading members and men mostly men of society and so there's this pomp and this circumstance that shows up as those gradual changes happen. The court is also going to be a major patron now of music, the same way that church is. And the most popular music is all instrumental. It's going to be orchestra and the smaller development of the chamber music so that a wealthy patron might be able to have four or six people rather than a complete orchestra come over in order to do a recital in their home. So music is actually going to start showing up in wealthy people's homes. Now, much of you, or many of you, know a lot about classical music without even really thinking about it. Classic music at Timeline, the waltz becomes fashionable. It is the number one dance, and it's very formulaic, which I'll show you in a moment. Mozart's one of the most famous operas of all time that criticizes the upper class and the lower class mixing with one another. The marriage of Figaro becomes out. The Magic Flute, a comedic opera. Old Lang Syne, long, long ago. This is our New Year's Eve song that we play when the transition um, from one year to the next. Beethoven's Fifth Symphony comes out, which is really the hallmark of classical music. <sighs> Excuse me. And it's going to start to move us into um, romantic music. It's that first piece where you start seeing some of the touchstones of romantic music that we'll talk about. Sir Francis Scott Key is going to write the poem, The Star Spangled Banner which is originally called the Defense of Fort McHenry, and that is our national anthem. So our national anthem is very much a classical piece of music. We're gonna have the Barber of Seville, for those of you that celebrate Christmas, Silent Night, Holy Night. Beethoven is gonna go completely deaf, and note, right before the age of classical music ends, we're gonna have Beethoven shatter the roof with a new composition, which many people consider the first piece of romantic music, and that's Beethoven Symphony Number no. 9. So to show you the formulaic and the aristocracy and what people will do, here's what the waltz looks like. The Viennese waltz is probably the oldest of all the ballroom dances and is very rich in history. So it look how- back to the 18th century and it differs from the normal waltz and it's twice the speed. And, and in Vienna the today, they have an entire season of these large these scale wealthy parties where you can go very out very and you pay about $200, but you go out on a very formal night of dancing, so some of the greatest dance halls in the right. That starts off on the right foot and moves around the floor counterclockwise. See how they seem to float? We're just concentrating on the man steps here. The man steps forward on the right foot, continues to the side. It's almost the like gliding, and then closes but it's right very formulaic. And it's the scene he's and then the over half of the action, with very little opposite, the left, um, improvisation. The right. And that is largely because of people like Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, who is going to establish us in the rules of classical music. Again, born in one of my favorite cities in the world, Salzburg, spends some time in Vienna, the center, where Beethoven um, is obviously going to make artwork. I should mention later on during this time period, this is a real hub being funded with lots of money, lots of beauty, lots of art. So such places, some things as Gustav Klimt, 
um, the lovely individual of the kiss, as well as this is where Sigmund Freud is going to create basically modern day psychology. Now, Mozart lived from 1756 to 1791. Note, not that long, and we do believe he died of tuberculosis. It is apocryphal on what kind of genius he was, but there is this idea that Mozart once heard an Allegri piece one time, that's another composer, in the Sistine Chapel, and then wrote it out in its entirety from memory, basically returning back just to make minor, and thus what he did is made the first illegal copy of anything ever from the Vatican, the property of the Vatican, so basically intellectual property rights. He is generally considered the second most influential composer of all time, sometimes put as as as, for, as third, I'm sorry, as third, only because we have to consider the father of harmony that we saw um, and listened to in the lovely Baroque period, Bach, who's considered the father of harmony. That's Johann Sebastian Bach. He has numerous children and progeny after that. His father, Leopold, was a leading music teacher, so from an early age, Mozart is getting some of the best instruction in the world. He can play the piano blindfolded at age five and six with his hands crossed and his first symphony he composes at age eight. He earned more than $100,000 today when adjusted for inflation by today's living standards, but he liked to live large, and so he was constantly in debt or living hand to hand, and he is the person that if you were friends with him, once he got paid for one of his operas, or once he got paid for doing one of his musical compositions, he would be the individual, the host of the party that's out treating everyone, so he was really well loved. And he standardized the opera and classical music features that we have today. Completely separate note, his sister, who was about a year older than him, supposedly as a child, was even a better piano player and a better musician than Mozart. But because she was a female, didn't get the kind of instruction that Mozart gets. There's a very good movie out about that. Now, with Mozart, one of the things we have to consider is one of his most famous pieces is this. This music is Eine kleine Nacht music, which basically in German, German is not, a, it's a very guttural language. And this means sweet music of the night. This is from 1787. If you listen to this piece of music, which you will do because I'm going to make you and you did for your homework, it increases at least for about 15 minutes, your spatial temporal reasoning in your brain. This piece of music, no matter where you go in the world, activates neurotransmitters in the brain. So think about the complex idea here. The vibrations that come into your ear, they somehow stimulate the inner vibrations in your brain that helps release a chemical that has the same impact on everyone around the world. And so we are currently searching for this neural pathway as it impacts the brain because the spatial temporal reasoning center of the brain is the area for complex or part of the area for complex mathematical calculations. And so if you were to take a test that involves the spatial temporal and some math operations, you would do a little better 15 minutes, at least for the first 15 minutes of the test, right after you potentially listen to Mozart. So we are spending millions of dollars each year actually trying to understand how this neural pathway works. Because think if we can activate this, we would actually know more A about how the human brain works because of Mozart's music. But we would also have potentially a way of helping people that have a huge math deficiency or math phobia that can't just complex and work on that part of the brain with their computer problem solve, solving ability. We might be able to help them with a pill become better at math, therefore promoting the human condition, because that could unlock all sorts of other potentials as we understand how the brain works. I'm going to stop the share for a moment because I think... thought I had a Ina Klein and Knock music piece here for you. All right. And I don't see it. Let's see if it's on the next one. All right. For some reason, this one did not come up. And so when you have the opportunity, go back and listen to a piece of the Ina Klein and Knock music and see if you can't feel that there is some kind of impact that it has for your brain power as it shows up. 
that's something I'll have you do on your own then. That Aina Klein and Nacht. I just don't see where that would be now. All right. When we look at the various stages of music, I am not going to go through all of these, but let's walk through. Remember the Baroque musicians that we talked about were Bach, Vivaldi, and Handel. It has one affect throughout, and that's really one of the distinguishing features of most of Baroque music. There's one emotion from beginning to end. Don't worry about polyphonic, homophonic. We, we can talk about that at a later date or more in a music theory course. In Baroque, you're going to have some abrupt changes in dynamic, some abrupt changes in tempo. And no, romantic music is going to show that as well. But one of the things that shows up, if you have only one affect, you are going to be looking at a piece of Baroque music. In Baroque, as we saw, string instruments are dominant, and the church is going to be the only patron. When we look at classical music of Mozart and Beethoven, you're going to have contrasting effects and moves, but it's going to be very controlled in progression, like, er, like Mozart and early Beethoven. Romantic is going to have some abrupt transitions in affect and emotions that show up. So the abrupt changes in tempo in Baroque, you're going to have slow developing changes in tempo. So the music's going to go very slowly. And they get a little faster. They get very, very, very fast. But it's going to be over a long period of time. Unlike romantic music, which might make these transitions very abrupt. And that's what we're going to see. So one of the things that very much shows up during this time period that gets codified, it's not invented, but codified it's by Mozart, is the entire idea of opera. Opera is a blending of music and theater in which music plays the dominant role. And there are different types of opera. I won't ask you to know these at this point. But one, just so you have some idea, is serious opera, where we take heroic subjects, such as gods and heroes of ancient times. That's the most serious of them. That's the drama. That's the neoclassical, very much classical kind of format. We have opera buffa, comedic opera, comedy or satire, like Mark, Mozart's Marriage of Figaro. So even though, remember, Mozart starts as a Rococo artist, so this is much more about the wit, the fantasy, the play that comes out of the Rococo, even though he's going to be canonized the rules of what opera looks like and how opera and classical music sounds. And then there's an operata, a light style of opera characterized by popular themes, a romantic mood, and humorous tone. And sometimes we have those as well. And this, at least this version of opera as defined here, almost all of you like opera without even knowing me. I guarantee you, I'd be almost willing to make a bet that $1 bet. And that is because probably all of you like this very quirky and interesting song that has no other equivalent in rock history, Bohemian Rhapsody. If you don't, here it is. This is from the movie Wayne's Room. This is my best friend, Garth Elgar. Hi. And yes, that is Mike Myers and Katie Carter. I think we'll go with a little from Bohemian a Saturday Night Rhapsody Live show, which Good became call. an entire movie and then a secondary movie in the world too. The first one is awesome. The second one you better really like Angel well first. So this is Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody, which is an operetta. Now think about the words here. It's about an individual who commits murder and who is going through the process of what he should do. And then he kind of loses his mind. Because they're going to pick up a friend. Bill, what are you doing here? You're partied out, man. I guess. What if he honks in the car? I'm giving you a no honk guarantee. What? Bill, um, you're going to spew. Spew into this. Okay. Easy come, easy go. Will you let me go? Wait, is he being possessed, possessed by the devil here? Oh, 
you ever seen this movie, this is a headbanging. And it's just an amazing thing. So it's a great parody movie if you ever actually have free time, which you may have, you are locked down for Corona or anything else. I highly recommend it. And so this is what an operatic looks like. And most people like that. And so generally when we look at um, classical music in the feature, here is the overture to the marriage of Figaro from 1791. So this is a comedic marriage. An opera, again, is the blending of music and theater, which music plays the dominant role. And think about the music. So here we have the introduction. Note, this is the marriage affair. Clearly, in the planning of the wedding, look how fast-paced things are and how quickly they change. Now, there are, of course, little problems in America, right? Because when you're planning a wedding, if you've ever been around anyone planning a wedding, you're already here for the flowers, you're here for the dress, you're here for the cater. Oh, no, crap, the flowers can't go. I've got to go do the flowers. Oh, what happened? I haven't picked all the flowers. I need to go back. Oh, I've got to pay some more. You know, I've got a wedding again. I've got a wedding singer. I've got this in me. There's a thousand things to do in a very short amount of time. Plus, you have your real life. And you're all hopped up and wonderfully because you're in love with the book. So you're constantly running around here and there and there. Oh, I got the tie. He's not going to tie. Oh, my groomsmen can't make it. What am I going to do? Where's this going to be? Where's this mother in law I got to wear? Where am I going to put the tables? What am I going to do? And so you have all these tiny little things that you're running around and doing all the time. And that's what this music does beautifully that it's going to be okay. Think about happy and uplifting and light. And note, the mood hasn't changed that much. It's about to change here. It slows down. We've gotten through that tempo, but it's taken us a minute and a half to get through that tempo. And now we're more in the calm phase of the planning of the wedding. And things are going well. Here's a slow, gradual pickup of the tempo. It's about to start. See the gradual, very much classical. Small little problems are about to emerge again. Here we go. The caterer, there's something wrong with it. They don't have the food I want. I can't afford this food. Oh, Mother Ben or Mother and Sister Ben won't sit next to them. They don't like each other. We've got to put them at the separate tables. And that's kind of the lovely planning that we're hearing as we run around trying to plan this. So this is the overture to opera that kind of sets the standards for classical music. Now, there's going to be a huge impact, as we saw in neoclassical, with the idea of patronage. And Mozart's Marriage of Figaro is almost burned. Burned, one of the great operas of all time because the Austrian Habsburg emperor outlawed political satires. And this was a satire of a, um, of a poor man wanting to marry a wealthy aristocratic woman. And so it challenged the norms of the day, which just didn't happen. Remember, women and actually arranged marriages are still around. Remember, they canceled out the Shakespearean theater um, and the Elizabethan theater because too many women were running off for love marriage. So we've reestablished love marriage again to unite families together because the white or the woman is the property of her of her father who basically uses her body and her childbearing to then pass off to the husband. So you have these two families that are in this arrangement together. And so really think about it. Marie Antoinette, an Austrian Habsburg woman, is moved in with the French king so that the Austrian Habsburg and the French basically don't go to war with one another. And so, and the, the French hate Marie Antoinette, as they said, later on they're going to behead her and call her all sorts of awful names that we saw in the Romantic period. Um, and eventually they behead her and her husband. And so this is actually what's being used. So a pretty good scene that shows up in um, Amadeus, the award-winning, actually Academy Award-winning film about 20 years ago, is the idea that here's the Austrian Habsburg Emperor who literally is listening to the marriage of Figaro and deciding whether or not this can even be performed. Patrons had that kind of power. Now, classical music features have gradual changes of tempo and dynamics with the restraint of emotions. Classical music is highly rehearsed. There's very little improvisation. It stresses order. And so even in a piece such as this, and so this is Mozart's Requiem, and I'll show you the image from the Mozart and literally it will show you the burial site or one of the ways that we believe Mozart might be buried. It's actually in a group burial site. And so supposedly this is an unfinished piece of music. 
There's also an apocryphal tale that this piece of music was written for his own funeral. It was not. He had a patron. He just happened to die while making it, and he dies of tuberculosis, which is an awful, awful disease. He dies early on in his career. And so the other one that we actually have to deal with today is Beethoven, who is generally considered the number one musician of all time. He really is responsible for the transition from classical music to this romantic music. So going from that aristocratic social political norms, remember his third symphony, Eroica, seen here, was composed for Beethoven, or was composed for Napoleon. When Napoleon crowns himself emperor, he rips it up in that little area right there. So we still have the lovely symphony, his third symphony for heroic, but it's no longer dedicated because dedicated to Napoleon because he believed in individual rights. He believed in the concept of democracy, republic, power to the people. So we're gonna move from the picturesque and the beautiful to this sense of all and sublime. And literally Beethoven is the individual that's going to do that with music. Now, Beethoven has a troubled personal life. He has an alcoholic father, and his mother dies when he's actually very, very young. He's of tuberculosis. He started to become deaf at 28, so he's already a professional musician. He has depression and suicidal ideations throughout his adult career. He's attracted to unattainable married aristocratic women and never married. Um, he quarrels and frequently behaves badly to other people. He often moves from dwelling to dwelling. He's got multiple different residencies. And he was wore filthy clothing, and yet he washed compulsively. Often had financial troubles. Um, and part of that is because he's going to break the patronage system. Temperamental and defiant, Beethoven scorned the patronage system, as we'll talk about here in a moment. And he scorned the upper class and often wandered the woods outside of Vienna alone in these dirty clothes while incessantly washing. He is one of the most important artists of all time because he's going to break that patronage system. The idea that someone comes and says, hey, I want to commission an opera for you. Beethoven later on in his life says, no, I want to make art that I want to make art. I want to make music about how I want to make music. And because of the popularity, he's able to slowly break the patronage system and other musicians and other visual artists start to say, I want to make art like I want to make art. This is the reason why romanticism is allowed to be created. Goya is a fantastic genius, but no one's paying him to do the black paintings. He's hoping that they will sell later on. The writings of Edgar Allan Poe, he doesn't have someone telling him to write about horror. No one would write about this. And so he sells them once he creates them saying, this will find an audience. And so two things happen. Number one, in the aftermath of Beethoven, we're going to have an explosion of human creativity like we've never seen before because artists are unleashed to do what they want to do rather than what the patronage very originally told them they have to do from the neoclassical period all the way earlier. Even Michelangelo, the great Michelangelo and da Vinci were under these restraints. Number two, we're also for the first time going to start to see starving artists. We really don't have starving artists in history before this. Why? Because if you had human creativity and you were not a member of a guild then and, and actually signing on on contracts, then you're not going to have the ability to be an artist, right? Because the guild actually makes sure that you are doing things and they're controlling not just the content, but they're also controlling the quality of what comes out. In the aftermath of this, there's no longer a guild system. You can still apprentice, you can go to art school, but art school, remember, you learn the rules. You don't have to pay a $15,000 fee except for the instruction. And afterwards, you don't have to create a masterwork. You can go on and make whatever you want and even struggle. And so we're going to get the struggling artist syndrome that comes out of Beethoven, but also an outpouring of creativity that we've never seen. Think about this. Up until Beethoven, and Beethoven lives all the way to the right time, 1827, or really moving very close to the modern age, 1827, less than 200 years ago. As we move here, in the history of humanity, going back in the Western tradition, we have looked at basically 12 art movements, right? Very quickly, we looked at prehistoric, Mesopotamian, Egypt, Greek, Rome, medieval, because dark ages don't have much. In this class, we looked at Northern Renaissance, Renaissance, Baroque, Rococo, and Neoclassicism. So basically 11 or 12 movements, very, very quickly, oh, I forgot mannerism, very quickly within the process. Now in the aftermath of Beethoven, in the 200 years since Beethoven, we've had 50 art movements. So we go to 12 to 50, 25,000 years of human history, 12 art movements, at least in the Western tradition. We're gonna have 50, we have 46 that are taking place today. Thank you, Beethoven. Later on when he's contemplating suicide, he writes this portion 
in a letter. Ah, uh, how could I possibly admit infirmity in the one sense which ought to be more perfect in me than in others, a sense which I once possessed in the highest perfection, a perfection such as few in my profession enjoy or have ever enjoyed. Contemplating suicide, this is what he thought about when he found out when he was in his 20s that he was going to go deaf and eventually go completely deaf. It, it was something that actually continued on to his family. And so the question that becomes, or one of the questions that becomes about the fifth symphony is the following. Is this the first piece of romantic music? What we can tell you is that we do believe it's one of the first, if not the first, artistic autobiographical works. It literally is about how he was feeling in 1808. It's about the same time he found, finds out he's going to go deaf. There is a motive throughout this three shorts and along that probably all of you know. which many people have been turned, basically, fate knocking at the door. There are going to be some abrupt changes, and so that is something we generally don't see in classical music, is starting the challenge. And so if you think about what's about to happen here, it's pretty remarkable from Beethoven. Let me see if I have it here. Okay. I'm going to stop share. So I can play the piece of music so we can talk about it with some notes on the page for us. All right. So as we look at this, is this the first piece of romantic music? Let's play it for you. Note how it starts off. This is autobiographical. Think about what he's saying about his life. Come on. This is a troubled personal life, but written in 1808. At this time, he's 37, roughly 37. Alcoholic father and mother. The motive is going to continue throughout. And so it's like one of the first bits of music that's completely unified from beginning to end. He's just starting to become deaf. He's having depression and suicidal ideation. He's attracted to unattainable women. He's poorly and frequently behaved badly to others. His part might be part of his mental capacity. Move often from dwelling to dwelling, but this is the autobiography. Oh, I found someone I really like. I'm falling in love. Things are going really well with my relationship. Yes, I'm going deaf, and so I'm not overly happy yet. But note the changes that are starting to happen. Very classical so far. I'm falling in love. I hope this person wants to marry me. Ah, she wants to marry me. She's falling in love as well. Things are grand fast. Let's go ask your dad. We want to get married. We love each other so much. Dad, can I marry your daughter? Get out of here, Beethoven. You're not in the same class. Note the abrupt dynamic and temporal changes that happen there. That is one of the features that we have in romantic music. So the question is, is this the idea of the expression of the picturesque still, or is where we start moving into the sublime in terms of someone's life? This is a fairly strong emotion that's being expressed, and it gets darker and darker. Why? You have all these things that have already happened, and now this new thing, which isn't going to bode very well for you. So in romantic music, as we look at the chart, basically the way that we have it is we have late music by Beethoven, the later music by Beethoven, otherwise it's considered classical. We have Wagner, Tchaikovsky, Berlioz, Chopin. Um, so we have orchestra, but Chopin is one of the great masters of piano. And piano is going to be one of the, the great new ways that we actually, it's been invented before, but one of the great new ways that we're actually going to express romantic music is largely going to be these beautiful piano pieces. So one of the art it's a great scientific understanding that ever been put on Phil Professor Fraser, the like or fantasy style or here, 
So thank you, Captain Picard, saying that Star Trek is better than Star Wars, my fantasy world, which very much is what the romantic world is. Remember, they are the inventors of science fiction and of fantasy and of children's literature, the greatest period for reading, but also music, maybe in world history. So the Ninth Symphony from 1824 is that artwork that actually challenges the patronage system completely. He writes it of his own volition. There's no one paying for it. He makes money from the performance itself. It's a unified composition. And if you listen to the words that go along with it, it is all about equality. And this one, to make it so much about equality, particularly in the finale, the, the, in the last movement, the human voice and instruments are equal in level. And so it appear, appears almost this cacophony that shows up the first time you ever use the human voice at the same level of instruments and a larger orchestra than had ever been made. So he's writing pieces for multiple different um, uh, kind of aspects, multiple different instruments that all become part of this. So we're going to celebrate imagination. We're going to celebrate the idea of all humanity coming together. It's going to be on sublime feelings of all, but really about absolute love and equality here. So this is going to be a strong emotion about just all humanity, what we can do when we come together. And that really is going to be our ninth symphony. Now the ninth symphony is so much about equality and challenging the patronage system, about artistic creativity explored. We use it frequently. So part of the Olympic national anthem or the Olympic international anthem actually comes out of ninth symphony. When individuals in China were marching for their rights in Tiananmen Square, they had boom boxes, boom boxes in the 80s, where they literally were playing as they got run over by tanks that were Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. In the aftermath of 9-11, we played two pieces of music. You can guess one, it's going to be Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. The only thing we played before this, of course, is our national anthem. Thank you, classical musician, going all the way to Sir Francis Scott Key with the Star Spangled Banner. Remember, originally titled Man. And when we actually took down the Berlin Wall, this is the piece of music, the orchestra piece of music that was playing as the wall fell. This is a um, remarkable accomplishment, specifically because Beethoven, by the time he composed this, was completely deaf. So one of the greatest and maybe the most important pieces of music in all of human history is made by a guy who never heard it. He felt the vibrations. He put a metal rod in his ear. He could play that up against the musical um, notes, the vibrations on a piano, and he could feel how it actually was vibrating and how the feeling would happen, the various voices coming in, all at the same level, for equality, women's rights he also was an advocate of. He was an advocate for gay rights. He was an advocate for everyone's rights. African-American rights, he was an abolitionist. He believed in equality. And that's what you see in equality here that we just don't normally see. So if I stop my share here again, actually, don't wanna do that yet. I wanna go back one. There we go. And I wanna play for you a piece of the finale of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Note how it sounds very similar, almost a patriotic mark from the neoclassical period, right? The idea of let's all form this idea together. And I'm going to fast forward to the last three minutes, just so you have an idea of what we're listening to here. Here we have the very classical features that show up. But know how we have the human voice, male and female, all coming in together. And they're all, and I wish it had gone longer, 
but all coming in together to play this lovely aspect. And this is what we're looking at in the Ninth Symphony. And in class, I'll play you the finale. Unfortunately, I don't have that here. So as we finish off Beethoven and talk about the idea of romantic music versus classical music, of course, Beethoven got his own perfect rhythm. And of course, it's not fair comparing him to Justin Bieber. We should have done Michael Jackson or someone to make it better. Look what the cat dragged back from the dead. Man, it looks like Chewbacca wiped his ass on your head. I'm the next Michael Jackson. You smell like Betty White. Here's the mask for you. Captain Bieber, Bieber denied. Because my voice is incredible and your music is terrible. Who even listens to Captain Soul? And he who had it. He least what to do me. And now that you're right next to me, I can understand what they use the dog to play you in the movie. Sit down, son, and let me give you a music lesson. I find I've got more confidence than Smith Wesson. Never say never, you'll never be forgetting. I crafted masterpieces that will last throughout the ages. Your music gets you bitches on your Facebook page. I'm committing verbal murder in the major third degree. My name is Beethoven, motherfucker. Maybe you heard of it. Now the St. Bernard version, I'm the real OG. You want to trade blows? You can't even hit purity. I got Kim Kardashian in my bed backstage. What's the last time your music got anybody? Play. I got a concert in five, so there's not much time left. <laughs> what else can I say? Y'all do the crazy jazz. I would smash you, but in Germany, we don't hit little girls. And I'm glad I'm deaf, so I can't hear that piece of shit my world. There's a crowd of millions waiting to hear my symphonies. You want to be a little white, touch your hair, show them to that seat. Who won? Who did? And so this leads us into the lovely period of romantic music. And the most famous of the romantic music is actually Wagner. Um, he's a romantic genius. He basically is known as having ear splitting music, particularly for this particular chord called the Tristan chord, which really challenges musical thought and musical understanding up at that point in terms of the rules of music. The bridal march is also his. So the one that actually women listen to is they march down the, the lovely aisle He's very anti-Jewish, and so later on, because of this anti-Jewish sentiment, sentiment, Hitler is going to choose him as his favorite um, composer of all time and use this for Nazi rallies. And so this becomes part of the problem. And that is going to bring us to, here's the Tristan chord. Now, the one that shatters the rules of music. The Tristan chord um, that Wagner didn't invent. Um, Chopin used it, uh, Beethoven used it, Bach used it, but it's what Wagner does with this chord. The chord itself is this, which, when you listen to it, creates, there's a certain... Uh, okay. It's almost a letting out of air when that chord hits the depression. But what's important about that? Think chord, about it this in the terms of the sublime. French sixth and do, sub dominant and dominant. None of that's for tonight. Then none of that's relevant. What's important to know is that it's introduced by a figure that is a big skip, which creates. It's so long and finally resolves to something that is ambiguous. It's not an arrival. It's, it's something that makes you feel a little bit off balance. It then resolves to something equally hanging in the air. Now, what I mean by that is the melody in itself An extra bit of melody comes in from the oboe and that resolves that resolves but the chords underneath it and the whole point of this is that they're challenging the rules of earlier music 
which is what musicians have always done, but very much in an older framework. This is actually trying to figure out that resolution that, no. that shows up in terms of the human condition and explaining the, the idea of either the sublime or individual human creativity, which is what Wagner is doing. And so the Rite of the Valkyries, it might be Wagner's most famous um, piece of music that we generally know. Um, he also has the Wedding March, which that probably is the most famous, but the Rite of the Valkyries is the most well-known because it's this piece of music um, that it will play in a moment. And so here's the question. Wagner has very anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish. It was around during the German and European environment that eventually is going to lead us into the, the killing of the Jews um, in the genocide of World War II and Hitler. And so the question becomes, can we love the art and hate the artist? And it's an interesting kind of scenario. As you know, we have Michael Angelo, who's a terrible individual as We've well. all been there scrolling through our daily feed only to discover that yet another person whose work we've at some point appreciated has said terrible things or committed odious acts. Artists and art professionals have certainly been among them, and the dead are not immune to our judgment, as Hannah Gadsby demonstrates so well in her epic takedown of Pablo Picasso in her Netflix special, Nanette. He said, each time, each time I leave a woman, I should burn her. Destroy the woman you destroy the past she represents. Oh, the greatest artist of the 20th century. Picasso's mistreatment of women and flagrant misogyny has been no secret to anyone who has studied his work or read anything about his life. But where does that leave us with his actual art? What do we do when we encounter it in a book or museum? Can we divorce the art from the artist? And should we? On one of my first trips to New York as a high school student, I saw a show at the Museum of Modern Art of work by the artist Chuck Close. It blew me away. His enormous portraits were not only astounding to me technically and optically, but also left me in this strange but enjoyable headspace of being intimately close in proximity to a person without actually knowing anything about them. This uncanny feeling of simultaneous nearness and distance feels even more pronounced to me when his subjects are famous people. When I read the recent accounts of a number of women who had humiliating experiences in his studio, I was bummed out. I felt badly for the women to whom it had happened and also disappointed because I knew I'd never look at one of his pictures the same way again. No criminal allegations were brought and he apologized and you can read all about it yourself. But now when I look at one of his works, I think about what the interaction might have been between the artist and the sitter. Was this a friend and the process a happy consensual one or an awkward or strained situation where the sitter was too embarrassed to object or leave? Why are some sitters asked to pose nude and others clothes? Which ones are paid models and which ones are not? I still marvel at the technical mastery in front of me, but now I'm also more aware not only of the artist's act of looking and making the picture, but also my own role as an observer of whatever is and was happening. Our reading of an artwork is always affected by the information we have or don't have about it. Sometimes we have a choice in the matter, like whether we read an object label in a museum or read articles or books about an exhibition or artist. If you don't have that information, you have a greater chance of a pure reading of it. But other times we don't choose what we learn. Maybe a friend had a bad run-in with the artist or you hear something anecdotally or a story breaks and you happen to see it in your feed. This works both ways, by the way. More information can have a positive impact on an artwork as well. Maybe you read an interview with an artist who's really rad and the next time you see their work, you like it more because of it. Maybe when you took that art class to fulfill that credit, you happen to learn about the amazing work of Leonora Carrington. And so the next time you come across it, you're more inclined to like it and give it more attention. Earlier this year, when allegations of inappropriate sexual behavior were swirling around photographer Nicholas Nixon, he asked that the ICA Boston take down their exhibition of his work early, stating, I believe it's impossible for these photographs to be viewed on their own merits any longer. Now, art is almost never viewed purely on its own merit. There are often cues that tell us something is important or unimportant, but I think Nixon was right. It would have been difficult for the art-going public in Boston to appreciate his pictures in the same way that they might have a few months before. I long adored his series of photographs of his wife and her three sisters, taken once annually since 1975. 
there are so many things to appreciate as you watch these sisters develop and evolve. The photographer's presence is only occasionally visible in a shadow, but is always palpable in the extreme intimacy and comfort that feels apparent between Nixon and his subjects. It's up to me now whether or how I reconcile my knowledge of the artist with his work. And my reading of his work has and will continue to change over time by forces within and outside of my control. Because it also matters how much the work itself reminds you of the odious acts, right? Like, it's pretty easy to see misogyny in some of Picasso's works, and less so in others. When I look at a Carl Andre sculpture, I'm not immediately compelled to think about who he is as a person. But it's impossible not to think about when looking at a painting of nude Tahitian girls by an artist who we know married three different Tahitian girls ages 13, 14, and 14, and infected them with syphilis. And I would definitely start to think about it if he was still alive, and I was to say, consider purchasing his work. Because part of this equation is considering who reaps the financial rewards of our attention, right? When another YouTuber does something stupid and everyone gets upset about it, do I want to go watch the offending video? Heck yes! But do I? Heck no! I can't bear to think I'll be a single digit in that view count or contribute financially in any way to that person and their fame. Our attention matters, and it's also being closely monitored, amounting to ad dollars, and influencing boardroom decisions about what kind of stuff gets made. Even if the artist is long gone and profits little from our attention, we still send a message to the powers that be that we're willing to look at and appreciate work by artists who behave in certain ways. We communicate more broadly to everyone around us that it's okay if you're a jerk. If you make good stuff, we'll consume it. So even if the past is past, which it never is, we're affecting what gets seen today and in the future. So what do we do? There's always the old asterisk approach, where you talk about the good stuff, but are sure to mention the bad stuff too. Art museums tend to do this awkwardly and inconsistently, and I don't envy their conundrum. Another approach is to reclaim the work in some way like Amber Ruffin's hilarious proposal on Late Night with Seth Meyers, making guilt-free alternatives to art created by problematic men. Hanging at your house and when people are like, ooh, is that a Picasso? Say no, it was made by someone who respects women. <laughs> or you can think of Jewish conductor Daniel Barenboim's hugely contentious decision to perform the work of Richard Wagner, known anti-Semite and influencer of Hitler, at a concert in Israel. I don't think there should be some giant reckoning where we unearth buried wrongdoings and purge our museums and art history books of any artist who's ever done something offensive. Our museums are the holders of our histories and should express the good with the bad. But when someone comes forward attesting to wrongdoings, or when in the course of research they're uncovered, there's no putting the cat back in the bag. People have a right to share their stories and we have a right to hear the stories they want to share. And then it's on us to weigh that knowledge with the work in question and make our own decisions about how and whether we let it affect our actions. Each case is different, and there are so many different facets to take into account. Aside from the nature of the offense and however seriously you take it, is the work a collaborative effort where the offending party is just one contributor out of many? Does the work not only remind you of the offense, but in any way reflect or promote the value system of the offender. Can we excuse a sexist, anti-Semitic scientist for their discoveries, but not an artist whose work is perceived as less measurably transformative in the world? Who suffers when the offender's work remains accessible? And conversely, who suffers when their work is no longer part of our cultural heritage? Look, you can make quality art and do bad things, but you should know that there will be consequences when those bad things are revealed and that you'll lose the privilege of a less clouded reading of your work when that happens. The cat will never go back in the bag. You can try to get rid of it, get it spayed or neutered so that it doesn't make more cats like it, or you can come to terms with the cat, try to reform it, or accept it for the compromised companionship it can offer. Okay, no more cat metaphor, I promise. But realize that it is a choice that you're making. We all play our part in the celebrity-worshipping culture that we're mired in and which has made it increasingly difficult for any of us to seriously consider separating the artist from the art. We are complicit with everything we click on and buy and watch. Artists, like all people, are complicated creatures, and because most of them aren't irreconcilably awful, 
the more you learn about a person, the more tangled and less black and white of a picture you'll likely get. But to try to completely separate the art from the artist is to minimize your own role as reader of the work. It's not that the artist's role is paramount, but that your role is. I still Thank like you to Marcel Duchamp Sternica and Nicholas inventing that in 1917 and the amazing Trump. mosaic portraits by Chuck Close in the 86th Street subway station in New York, although I do wish he decided not to include two self-portraits. But I don't worship their creators or labor under the delusion that good art comes at the expense of being a decent person. And most of all, I realize that these situations are usually very nuanced and that each of us is entitled to draw our own lines. But if we care about what kind of creative work gets made and offered to us in the future, we've got to be intentional about what we see and consume and either actively or passively support. If you'd like to support what we're doing. And so as we think about musical theory and musical kind of a Wagner, the idea is an anti-Semite, the question is, would you use his wedding march as, I mean, think about your wedding. Most likely the diamond ring you're going to have, not to ruin all your things, most likely the diamond ring that you have um, that you're going to put on your finger is harvested and probably supports slave and child labor in Africa. Your chocolate cake, most likely that chocolate comes from slave labor as well. The music that you're going to play when you walk down the aisle is by an anti-Semite, it's the bridal march. And you have to make conscious decisions now that you know that. Now, there are ways around this. Buy Canadian diamonds. They are non-slave. Buy fair trade chocolate. Like, you do have choices that, that show up. But that's the question. What choices are you willing to make in terms of the process? Now, my family thinks that I am ridiculous because my wife and I, who are human rights advocates and, and literally for children and women's rights around the world, only buy um, mutual funds that um, are socially responsible. So they don't support um, anything that goes to the promotion of hydrocarbon in the economy or um, slave trade or uh, unfair working conditions. Now, the profit margin that we make each year in our mutual fund is significantly less. So if the stock market goes up by 15 percent, our stocks might only go up by 7 percent. Hopefully this will be corrected when a large group of people start investing in these socially mutually funds. But it is a decision we make. It does mean that I will retire later than other individuals because of the way I save my money. It also means that in that process, I'm also doing less harm and more good for the planet than I otherwise could have if I was just putting it in other saying, all right, when I make a million dollars, I'll donate some of that money back because my money would grow faster. That's a conscious decision that my wife and I have made since we were in our early 30s. And so as we had money to save, that is a conscious decision you can make as well. I hope everything is well for you as we go forward. And the last thing I want to leave you then with is Wagner. The Ride of the Valkyries. This is a piece of music, and this is Hitler's favorite piece of music. It talks about human heroes being collected, killed, collected by these Norse gods to make a more powerful army in the future. And later on, Hitler is going to use this piece of music, really as heroic as hunting down Jews and hunting down the enemies. And so when we think about it, it's not fair. Wagner died before Hitler was born. So we can't make the direct connection, but it is his anti-Semitic ideas that promoted Hitler to think that he was the greatest of all German composers. So we have the two things that play in concert. Look how triumphal this is. There's one of our Valkyries. So that is something to consider. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Bye.